Welcome to the Film Analysis, today with Top Gun Maverick by Joseph Kosinski. In 1986, Top Gun was released in theaters. It was a surprise success for Tony Scott. The budget amounted to just 15 million dollars. But then it paid off big time. The title song, Take My Breath Away, composed by Giorgio Moroda, is still remembered today. This new movie's title song was written by Lady Gaga and is well worth listening to. It is also reminiscent of the 80s power ballads. At least it trumps the Spotify optimized melodyless drone that can be heard everywhere nowadays. We already clearly see here this film is at home in the 80s and the new film longs for the 80s. Top Gun Maverick is of course extremely retromanic. The new film picks up where the old one left off aesthetically. That's abundantly clear at the beginning. Afterwards, Joseph Kosinski detaches a little from the predecessor. Everyone who appears on the screen has aged, except for, of course, Tom Cruise. One notices a Cruz's face changing strangely in some scenes. Well, uh, that's one downside of remaining timeless in cinema. Maverick should be a decorated flying ace after 36 years as his service to the Navy is undisputed. Quite a few disciplinary actions in his career have prevented him from climbing the career ladder. However, he sticks to his old self. He disregards the instructions of his superiors. His job now consists of subjecting aircrafts to endurance tests, racing fast and faster right from the start until the material no longer withstands the pressure. When in doubt, Tom Cruise's body is always more stable. The heroic is defined by someone growing beyond his self. But that's not actually intended in a system based on chains of command. Heroic, however, is now someone who, if in doubt, is only committed to himself and disregards orders. That's how it was in the old Top Gun and that's how it is in the new one. Maverick surprisingly lands a new job mediated by Admiral Kaczynski aka Iceman, once more played by Val Kilmer who has survived his disease that is very marked by it and can hardly speak. Maverick is now to teach as an instructor in the flight school Top Gun. It concerns a delicate mission. In some rogue state, a plant for uranium enrichment is to be torpedoed. In a few weeks, these young pilots need to be ready for this highly explosive mission. Suspense translates to its minimal definition. Tension means fighting against time, which is perfectly logical. No matter how big the problem, if there were an infinite amount of time to solve it, no tension would remain whatsoever. But when the problem grows and time is short, tension maximizes. The maneuver proves to be extremely complicated. The pilots must weave the planes through tight spots. It's going to be a difficult undertaking and good training is of the essence. Of course, no one can do this better than Maverick, telling the young pilots right away, you know the manual, but you can throw it away now. Now it's up to you what you do with this machine. Two aspects matter in the maneuver. The heroic element plays a big role also as the American machines match the enemy's ones. It's a level playing field. It all comes back to the individual now. 
the circumstances remind us of Clint Eastwood's Sully, in which the machine doesn't work. Consequently, only the human can stop the catastrophe. The beginning of Top Gun Maverick already depicts Maverick belonging to an extinct species, fighter pilots. Will you still need them when you have drones? Here, the human being becomes the center of attention again. The second aspect is interesting from a political point of view. There's talk of some broke stake and yes, there's this uranium enrichment plant, but the movie tries to be apolitical. It avoids being concretely political. It's not about some systemic conflict. It's not about China, Russia uh, or anywhere else. Certainly also due to marketing in said countries, theatrical releases and box offices. One should ask oneself whether the original Top Gun was really as political as is often pictured. The old Top Gun is closely associated with the Reagan era. But is Top Gun really that bellicose? Sure, it contains these incredibly indulgent images of guns, jets and so on. But in a way it's already pop culturally cushioned, resembling a music video. It's no longer really about a serious conflict being fought out. To some degree, the end of the Cold War is already heralded in the first Top Gun and we must ask ourselves, when does a bellicose conflict take place? Certainly, there is also the reception component that is what we read from the images. In any case, we are dealing with a decidedly post-heroic film. Maverick represents a post-heroic hero. He may have been foolhardy, but he doesn't want to sacrifice himself for anything. He wishes to survive. When it comes to the intricate mission in the rogue state, the superior tells Maverick, yes, the fighter pilots are aware of the risk they take. Those risks include being a fighter pilot. Maverick replies, I don't accept that. He wants to bring everybody who is on the mission back home in one piece instead of sacrificing himself or his fellow fighter pilots for a higher cause, for America, for example. In this regard, we are dealing with a post-heroic hero. The movie contains an interpersonal conflict which is supposed to carry the whole film but it fails to do so. Maverick still feels responsible for the death of his old comrade Goose. Goose's son, Rooster, played by Miles Teller, ends up becoming one of Maverick's students. This movie handles their relationship rather insensitively, how the two compete in a way unspoken things stand between them, but the movie fails to establish a real conflict. It's interesting that there's a surrogate father story being told here. We'll still have to talk about the fact that this film's opening is stripped of sexuality. So it's quite fitting that we have a father-son constellation at the center here. There's also a love story for Maverick woven in, but it couldn't be more trivial, so we'd rather skip it. Let's not kid ourselves. Besides the impressive flying scenes, there is only one interesting scene. It's the reunion of Maverick and Iceman. Iceman is physically very better at spends all his time at home, he's in pain, communicates almost only with the aid of a computer. Now these comrades, both about the same age, meet. There's a bit of humor, a bit of sentimentality, but it's not too maudlin. It's very sincere. 
Cruz is 59, Kilmer is 62. The former remains eternally young. The latter is marked by age and illness. This meeting is, of course, quite crucial because what happened between these two also shaped the first film. Iceman has always been loyal to Maverick, was responsible for him not being dismissed from the service despite disciplinary proceedings. Let's not shy away from pathos. Iceman always loved Maverick. This, of course, leads us to the famous Tarantino thesis from the film Sleepless Me, Top Gun being all about the struggle with homosexuality. In this famous scene, an upset Tarantino explains Top Gun having the most brilliant script and that it's all about how these two men, Iceman and Maverick, deal with their homosexuality. Is what Tarantino is saying true? From the very beginning, there's a tremendous tension between the two of them and they also repeatedly negotiate a relationship of dominance with each other throughout the film. One witnesses quite telling looks. Maverick hesitates and dithers. There's that famous beach ball scene presenting these bare torsos very lasciviously. Tony Scott didn't come up with the staging himself. He based it on the photos of Bruce Weber. This environment is purely male. Scott establishes a somewhat homosocial space. The whole scene is of course a metaphor for homosexual sex, which you are not allowed to show if it were to be shown, the tension of the film would immediately vanish. Just by indicating homosexuality, the film delivers much more suspense than if it were simply made explicit. Maverick is playing against Iceman, but Maverick keeps looking at the clock. He seems to have an appointment. After all, he breaks off the game and speeds away on his motorcycle to his female superior, Charlie, who interestingly has a gender-neutral nickname. This love story between Maverick and Charlie is cut into this film in a very pecu peculiar way. It doesn't fit together at all. There's a disparity, but the tension, this actual conflict that Tarantino also describes, intensifies when Tom Cruise goes to her after the volleyball game. Then a second short film begins, you can say. That's also shown by the fact that Take My Breath Away kicks in as if the film was about to begin. And then what? They are sitting together, talking, she's listening to country music and Maverick says, aha, that reminds me of my mother. And of course, there's no sex afterwards. There's a ban of incest. You are not allowed to have sex with your mother. He wants to take a shower, but she doesn't want him to take a shower at her place. And she also knows that she somehow missed the opportunity to seduce him. And he roars into the distance on his motorcycle. In the very next scene, we see her again the next day in the elevator. There's Charlie dressed as a boy, wearing a baseball cap with a denim jacket. Allegedly, it must have been the case that the actress Kelly McGillis already had a different hairstyle, something had to be added. She was already under contract for another movie. That's why they put this cap on her, put on a denim jacket and that's it. But we don't need to know how that scene came about because these stories exist in any film. In the end, the movie speaks for itself. 
And then there's that last scene between Maverick and Iceman after the su successful mission. It's remarkable what Tarantino achieves now. After they were both very successful in this mission and both proved their manhood, they meet again and they are passionate for each other. Tarantino carries that out and tells it in the film with an interlocutor. This very interlocutor also lets himself be convinced more and more of this homoerotic interpretation until they both arrive at the end of this scene stating. Iceman supposedly said to Maverick, you can ride my tail anytime. Of course, Iceman didn't say that. In fact, he states, you can be my wingman anytime delivering another homoerotic component. Tarantino allows himself a joke here. During his interpretation, he had convinced his male dialogue partner and himself in such a way that a homoerotic desire has arisen in himself, in both. They render the implicit wingman explicit through tail, through dick. In Top Gun Maverick, we seem to have switched the scene, if you will. Maverick goes to the lover first. They talk, showing again what they have in common. And then he arrives at the beach, followed by a beach football scene. Interestingly, we don't see any eroticization of the body anymore, no longer resembling Weber's photos. Furthermore, we see a woman there and another one watching. The homoeroticism ceased to exist here, although one might object we live in a enormously liberal times, enjoying marriage for all. I can recommend everyone to rewatch this scene where Tarantino talks euphorically about Top Gun. Typical party talk, unfortunately, you rarely find such talkers at parties. The crucial thing, Tarantino could not deliver such a dialogue today when watching the new Top Gun. First, this second part confirms my thesis that Hollywood has become more and more prudish. Sexuality has been outsourced to the porn industry. Even the heterosexual sex scenes are not worth mentioning or hardly take place. Lovers merely lay down in bed for a little while. What if liberalization has caused homoerotic desire to disappear. In any case, the erotic attraction of the ban is gone. What has also disappeared is all the ambivalence that could furnish a film and which constitutes Top Gun. This dialectic of desire fueled many old films. Just think of Lawrence of Arabia. Today we experience Boredom. Today we no longer witness this tension, this interpersonal tension. If homosexuality was to be broached in the new Top Gun, it would be done in today's form of confession. Some character would come out and might tell the story. With the loss of homoeroticism, masculinity is also lost to some extent. It is at least greatly throttled in this film. It dives no longer in testosterone as the first one did. If the film were not so hollow, one could still watch the cinema thinking here because it is interesting that during the scene of transience where we see the fragile Val Kilmer there is a scene full of vitality where we see the young pilots, but we also see the apparently eternal Tom Cruise who naturally fails to equal the pilot's youth. This is where physical cinema could begin. 
where we could start to reflect on the body, but unfortunately the film fails to deliver. Yet the body is clearly the focus here, these enormous g-forces acting on the body during these aerial maneuvers, the actor's faces contorting. Even the cinema seat itself now becomes a pilot seat quite convincingly implemented. But unfortunately, this film doesn't get to fly once as Tony Scott still managed to do. The new Top Gun cannibalizes the old Top Gun. It displays another work of nostalgia, merely dwelling on the past. Why do the action scenes fascinate in the new Top Gun? Sure, they are technically breathtaking, you can't film it any better. It's outstanding and of course leaves the first part in the shade. But that's not essential. What matters is what we admire about the action scenes and what, we makes, uh, what makes us uh, breathe a sigh of relief. For once we have arrived in the present in the here and now. Finally, the film strips off its nostalgic garb and leaves the past behind. In all the other scenes, we only watch, but we do not see. It would be nice if you would like to support the film analysis financially. You can do so via my bank account or PayPal. Also, you can find me on Patreon. Thank you very much.